SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. sequence would be initiated with the rise in signal level and quantity received from the planetesimal beacon. This orbiting beacon had been confirmed as the point from which the signals were being broadcast at random trajectories. Spectral analysis had confirmed that the source was not gaseous and that nuclear consumption of gas and other plasma material was not taking place. It was not, then, a star, brown, black, white, orange, blue, opaque, translucent, or transparent. Because of the position of the receiving equipment, beyond the orbit of the beacon satellite, this expansion of data seemed to occur on the dark side of the Terminator from a heavy mass solitary planetary material on the planetesimal. The transmission, therefore, would be adjusted in form to coincide with signals being received. The mode would become congruent. The message transmitted would be perfunctory. Command, begin, now. The message, carrier, transversion packet signal was on its way to Earth. Chapter 6 Sam shoveled the food into his mouth as if he hadn't eaten all day. He hadn't. His cousin, Uncle Stu, and Aunt Marion gave Sam their full quiet attention as he attacked his dinner in the family dining room. Aunt Marion had always insisted that Sam be part of the family and that all members of the family would eat together at the same time. Tonight, at a modest setting, Sam was gorging on brisket potatoes, cooked carrots, and string beans. Sam, didn't you eat the lunch I packed for you? Marion asked. Sam slowed for a moment and looked up. No, I mean yes, but I'm still starved. The family ate quietly. Cousin Sarah put her fork down and took a deep breath. She rested her elbows on the table and studied Sam. Sam, tell everybody what you told me today. Sam didn't look up or miss a bite of his meal. Marion continued to cut through a tough piece of meat and waited for an answer from Sam. Come on, Sam, it's interesting, even for a cluck like me who doesn't know anything about what you're doing. Cindy giggled at her older sister. Mindy asked, what's a cluck? Sarah, sitting at an angle from Sam, grabbed his arm. Come on, tell everybody. Sam pulled his arm away and shrugged off the question. Stu looked up from the table. When his deep voice rolled across the table, it was calm, steady, and reassuring. Sam's uncle never showed any anger. He kept to himself. He was not effusive with his children, Marion or Sam. He could laugh loudly, but generally he was quiet. He moved and talked slowly, but there was always that baseline strength and authority. Son, why don't you tell us? We're interested, Stu said. Mindy quickly followed in her high, penetrating voice. Yes, Sammy, tell us about your experiment. Sarah corrected, experiment. Marion looked at Sam out of the corner of her eye. You're spending too much time with that, Sam. Your schoolwork is going to suffer. I have to do it, Aunt Marion. I just have to do it. He answered quietly. Sam put down his fork and knife and glanced around the table, then directly at Stu. As he began to speak, he seemed more confident. His voice grew in strength. He was talking about something he loved to do. This morning, as I was leaving for school, quickly, I looked at the computer. And then, at a printout, I took with me to school. The printouts in the computer indicated that I picked up something last night on my alpha microwave dish. A signal. An alien signal, maybe, from space. 
from extraterrestrial source or maybe civilization. I'm not sure of the exact source point, but Cindy and Mindy immediately began to howl with laughter. Sam's lips pursed. His face turned red with anger. Quiet, you two. Let's hear what Sam has to say, Marion shouted. Her efforts to quiet the twins were unsuccessful. Stu gave his girls a hard stare, but they didn't notice. They were hysterical with laughter. Sarah shouted, Will you two shut up? Sam pushed back his chair hard. He stalked out of the room. Cindy squealed. Sammy searching for alien monsters with green, slimy, hairy bodies and smelly, too. Stu grabbed her arm. That's enough, he said firmly. Cindy stopped laughing for a moment, then began to scream with delight again. Stu grabbed his napkin and laid it out gently next to his plate, then looked across the table at Marion. I'll talk to the boy, he said. As Stu shuffled toward the living room, he took a deep breath and went over in his mind what he would tell Sam. Stu knew that Sam was intelligent and sometimes high-strung. He still was his guardian, but he was not his father. Sam never reminded him of that, but they both knew it. But firmness and quiet firmness was Stu's best weapon, he figured. As he took his final steps into the living room, he looked down at Sam, who was stretched out in front of the television, flipping through channels, pressing the remote, and staring blankly at the screen. He finally found a program that interested him on the independent television station in San Diego. Sam saw familiar characters of Mr. Spock, Captain Kirk, Dr. Bones McCoy. McCoy was trying to teach Spock about some human emotion that Spock did not understand and that McCoy believed Spock needed in order to survive. Stu stopped for a moment and looked into Sam's face. My God, he looks so much like Peter, he thought. Stu still had difficulty reconciling the loss of his brother and his beloved sister-in-law, Anne. At that moment, he missed his brother more than ever, and the pain and loss and yearning were emotions that Stu knew Sam was experiencing too. Stu and Peter Alexander were very much alike when they were growing up near San Diego. They both loved to work with their hands to experiment, Stu was more mechanical. He loved cars and contraptions. Peter loved his electronics and the outdoors. He would spend hours in the crystalline air of the desert. Stu remember how excited Peter was about the lack of light pollution and how he later decried the growing light contamination problems that nearby Mount Palomar was experiencing. How many years now, Stu wondered, two or four, since Peter and Anne were lost? No, maybe it was in the fall of 1984, the Olympics. Did that? No, it was later. Stu suddenly returned to reality. He had to stop thinking self-indulgence was foolish when a pain Sam was sitting in front of him. But for a moment, it was a warm and soothing feeling to think of his brother and of the barefoot days, the knee-high sodas, the hot summer days near the cool turquoise ocean, in La Jolla. He slowly turned the corner by the couch and eased next to Sam. Sam did not move. He just stared at the screen, emotionless. Stu slowly and gently reached over to the remote control and turned down the volume of the television set. Sam did not resist. He wanted to listen to the timbre of his uncle's soothing voice. Sam, may I sit with you for a moment? Yeah, I guess so. You know, Sam, ever since your mom and dad were lost over the Pacific in their plane, we thought of you as our son. We've tried to treat you like our son. We love you and care for you like you were our son. Stu put his large hand tenderly on Sam's shoulder. Do you know, Sam, how much we care about you? Sam turned towards Sue. His eyes began to glisten. He was trying hard to stay strong, to be tough. It was something he had developed, something he thought he must do to protect himself. I know, Uncle Stu, I know. We have allowed you a great deal of freedom in the process. We have allowed you to use your folks' insurance as you see fit. Because we feel you're smart enough and old enough to know what to do. We love you, Sam, and just hope you feel the same way about us. I do, Sam said. He turned away. It's just that I'm constantly being teased by Cindy and Mindy about my work. 
It's bad enough that I have to hear about it at school and from other people. They are just two rambunctious little girls. Listen, Sam, Stu said, grasping his nephew's shoulder a bit harder. Just have a little more patience with them and us. Try to control that short, fused temper of yours. Sam sighed. I'll try. We only want what's best, what your parents would have wanted for you. I hope I know what that is, Sam said wistfully. Well, you'll have to come to terms with that. But don't try to rush it. Don't push yourself or us. Don't try to... Sam's concentration began to fade. He drifted. The television audio seemed to increase inside of his head. The Star Trek theme overpowered everything else he heard, even what Stu was trying to tell him. What was he saying, Sam thought? How am I supposed to answer? "Uh Uh-huh, Sam replied to Stu. The sky was black. Then he looked toward the garage and his second-story living quarters. His eye followed the line of the garage upward toward the flat roof. He could see the outline of his two small parabolic satellite dishes. He stared at the alpha dish. Stu continued to speak. Sam heard the Star Trek theme even louder. Sam squinted as he stared at the dish. It looked larger, as though he had the ability to adjust his field of vision, penetrating the dish, seeing the signals being received and detected. It was like watching a movie, seeing a slowly, steady zoom in on the dish and visualizing a steady stream of electrons flowing over the low noise amplifier at the end of the dish. He began hearing in his head the raspy white noise and the embedded warbling tone. Stu was speaking, but what was he saying? The tone, the warbling tone, blocked out any conversation.